um, you don't necessarily mention ethics and morality in non-human creatures. It's not found, uh, it, it's not exhibited in a manner that we think it is. But when we do see something, we put a value, we, we say, oh, that's an ethical behavior, or that's a moral behavior on the creatures that are non-human. They themselves may not know that, but they seem to behave or, or exhibit something that seems to be what we think is a ethical or a moral behavior. So it's really a very human trait. So the topic again is morality and ethics in software. Can it be measured? The key word here is measured. And I think the one word answer is no. So that's the end of my talk. <laughs> but, 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 but. <laughs> that was just a trick answer there. It can't, it can't be measured, but it can be guided. I think this is the one area, uh, chaos being trying to figure out how do I measure community health and analysis of community health. This is an area which is not something that you can easily measure, but you still need to figure out what it is. So let's just get some basics sorted out first. Software is essentially an expression of algorithms. I think the few of us in this audience, I think most of us would agree with that. And algorithms in turn embody the sum of ideas and the thought processes of the developers. That's really what it is. Somebody thought of some algorithm and implemented it in software. So the ethics and morality of developers will find its way in subconsciously or consciously in the software that they, uh, in the algorithms that they develop and the software that they write. You cannot separate the two. It is next to impossible to do so because it's a very natural process. It's just like, to me, it's just like breathing. You cannot stop that. It's going to continue. But what we can do is you can say, hey, don't breathe this bad air. You can cover your nose and wear a mask and get away from it. So similar to that, when you, are, when you have a sense of understanding of what ethics and morality is, you are high, it's highlighted to you, you can then act upon it based on that understanding so that what you build has got that aspect built into it. So I, I did put at a very in fine, very fine print, what about AI? Um, I deliberately didn't put the words uh, artificial intelligence in when I gave my brief for this talk because I didn't want it to be clouded by that consideration. But AI is an aspect of what we are talking about, but it is bigger than just AI in that sense. So ethics and morality, most people use them interchangeably. It's sometimes very hard for us to figure out which part is the moral part and which part is the ethical part. Um, they both have got to do with right and wrong and good and bad. Uh, morality in general, again, this is a very generalized statement, it's a personal value system. It's what I feel as this is being right, this is being wrong. I feel morally obliged to not cheat on my employers. I feel morally obliged not to cheat on my spouse. So things like that. So that's a very personal thing. Whereas ethics is the general community, the group of people. There is a moral aspect to it as well. Because your moral considerations impact on your ethical view and that becomes the collective view. So for the purposes of this talk, I will use uh, ethics to describe both of them because it's, it's very fluid between the, uh, in terms of usage. So what is ethics? Now this is a bit of uh, work after lunch, so this is work for you to do, all right? So I'm gonna ask some questions, and please raise your hands or ho however you want to do this so that you won't fall asleep. Let's start with the very first one. Ethics has to do with what my feelings tell me is right or wrong. Is that what ethics is? How many think this is about right? Now you can move your hands because that, you, that way you have blood flowing. You're scared to answer, all right? So there is, <laughs> all right, next question. Ethics has to do with my religious beliefs. Okay, two. 
Being ethical is doing what the law requires. One, interesting. So if the law doesn't require it, I don't have to be ethical. Is that what it suggests? I, I want you to think about that. Ethics consists of standards of behavior our society accepts. Yeah, more or less. I don't know what ethics means. <laughs> that's, about, that's pretty much all of us, right? <laughs> it's a tough word, I agree. It's a very tough word. Um, so these are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six questions which I, you know, I thought would get you going for a bit. So ethics, again, uh, it helps to go back to what is it trying to say. It's a set of standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do. Keyword humans is us. We are not necessarily in taking this and laying it on our pets, the animals in the zoo, the fish in the sea. We are not doing that. We cannot do so because there is no way for those creatures to reciprocate or even express and, uh, and, and show an understanding of what we are trying to say. So, prescribes what humans ought to do in terms of rights, obligations, and benefits of society, fairness, and so on. It also includes the right to life. So, is it ethical to have the death penalty, for example? Is it right or wrong? The right to freedom from injury, and the right to privacy. Now, the last bit is, is tricky in today's context. The amount of issues that we face. Is it ethical for somebody to collect data on me? So, I'm a developer. Why do I care about ethics and morality? Why do I care? I mean, I'm a developer. doesn't matter. I just write the code. I just make things happen because I'm a hot shot. I can write code in a very obfuscated way. Nobody will understand except for me, although 10 minutes later, I don't know what I wrote. But that's me. I'm the developer. I can do so. So it is very interesting when I was doing the research for this paper, I, the earliest reference to anything about morals or ethics came from 1968. It, this is like a uh, seminal document from the NATO Software Engineering Conference. Um, and it, this was a statement that was made by Douglas McEl, uh, McElroy, who was a, um, a researcher at that point in time. And he basically said, it would be immoral for programmers to automate everybody but themselves. Now, this is 1968. That's, uh, what, 51 years ago. So he's talking about automation. He's talking about software. I mean, imagine what, is, what did we have in 1968 that was... I mean, we haven't landed on the moon yet. And yet, he's talking about automation of work, perhaps, that we create as developers that will make other people out of a job. That's what we are seeing in many ways today, 51 years later. But he says that's an immoral thing to do. Now, as developers, have we had a chance to think about these things? Probably not. So the questions and statements of morality and ethics in software have been raised for a very long time. So this is nothing, it's not a new thing at all. It's just that it's becoming more evident to more of us because of what's happening around us. And we are asking the harder question. So this has led uh, by uh, uh, efforts by a couple of organizations, uh, the ACM and the IEEE uh, Computer Society which adopted a code of ethics back in 1992. And they, they updated it last year. I must tell you one thing. In doing the research for this project, uh, for this talk, I know I read the, I, uh, the ACM code of ethics back when I was in graduate school. Uh, actually, I don't know what I read then because in graduate school we had some code of ethics from the school, from, from Oregon State. And I don't think that was based on anything other than whatever the school said. But what was interesting was they were talking about in 1992 things like uh, making sure that you as a software developer keep on track with the project schedule and pricing and don't exceed the pricing. 
It's like, really? Is that an ethical consideration or is it a business decision? So it was a very bizarre set of uh, code of ethics that I, uh, the ACM had then. But thankfully, I feel that the 2018 updated version, which I will, I, from what I read, it took about a year and a half to two for them to revise and review it. It's far more coherent. It really feels more like a code of ethics than otherwise. So these efforts are not dissimilar to the stuff that we all probably have heard of, like the Hippocratic Oath, which actually has been updated. But Hippocratic Oath seems to be one people kind of remember or I've heard of. In the medical profession, they don't use this anymore. They have an updated one uh, from Geneva or something. And again, it's got local variations to within each country, whatever it is that they, they, they want to use for their own purposes. But it pretty much centers around life is precious, don't mess up with it, you know, do the right thing. So fairly consistent stuff. So the medical profession has that. The legal profession has that, wink, wink. Um, the business, sports, pretty much every endeavor of whatever humankind does has got some form. A lot of it may not be written down. It may be handed down by word of mouth, or it could be the tradition of a community that this is how you do it. You don't do it this other way. But what is useful is that this is a consideration that we as engineers, as software developers, should consider what is it that we can do for the profession that we are in. Given the kind of impact this profession has across all of industry, every, there isn't a single industry that is not impacted by software. If we accept that as a premise, there's a lot of onus on us to do the things and do it right. So the ACM is kind of interesting in the way they crafted the updated version. They set up in four different buckets. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just wanted to highlight they had a, an, an idea of the general principles of ethics, one for professional responsibilities, like making sure that you guide and you be a mentor of others to do the right thing, as a manager perhaps, um, leadership responsibilities. And the last bit is about how do I comply with the code? Now, nothing is useful if it's not enforced. You may have all the laws on the, of the land, but if nobody enforces it, you might as well have not had it. So how do I enforce and make sure that people are complying with whatever is stated? So the compliance part is kind of interesting. And I was a little bit uh, amused, I must say, when I read the compliance part of this uh, ACMs. They only have like two or three points uh, to explain it. And there isn't, uh, it, it was not evident to me, uh, and I did ask the question, I haven't got a reply from ACM yet, is would this is really a, a compliance and enforcement of the members of ACM, not about others in the profession who are not members of the ACM. So that does beg a question, does it matter if they make people comply if they're not members? How do I do that? That's a very difficult thing to, to ask, especially if you were saying, I want to comply with ACM rules, but I'm not a member, so does it apply to me? So I, I'll just show some of the points that they tried to explain in the uh, ethics uh, part of uh, the ACM. Um, what is interesting is it, these things are fairly straightforward. There's nothing unusual and nothing uh, 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 that you don't find in any other profession, especially point one, point two, avoid harm. I mean, I think that's fair. You don't want to harm anybody for anything. So avoiding harm is a very natural thing to have. 1.6, respect privacy. I think that's an important thing. So if I were working in an organization that is doing stuff and I do know that the code that I'm going to write is going to expose somebody's private information, what do I do? Can I call it? Can I say, no, I'm not gonna do this? 
and so on. I'll skip the other slides because this just puts up some additional information, but I want to highlight the number four, which is the compliance of the code. Uphold, promote, and respect the principle of the code, treat violations of the code uh, as inconsistent with the membership of the ACM. So I can continue being unethical as long as not member of ACM. There you go, job done. But I think that's part of the problem, that they need to figure out how best to make this universally acceptable, not only for members. So the value of codes of ethics increases with real life use case. That means you actually do it, you experience it, you face a situation, you have to make a, a decision. If you don't see that happening, it's very hard to internalize it. You don't know why you want to do that. So how could we as a community be the catalyst to adopt uh, uh, for adoption and adherence of such codes and even the evolution of such things? So here, I like to highlight three examples. This is some of the stuff that I, I managed to uh, do a lot of reading and, and actually contacting some of the authors of this. Uh, the first one is the Markula Center of Applied Ethics. Uh, this is located at the Santa Clara University. And they have an app, believe it or not, there's an app, which is nothing more than a, 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 a website that asks you uh, ethical questions, and they give you a slider, and in the end it jumps, so you have a problem, you describe the problem, and then it asks you a bunch of questions, and you choose the answer that you like, or that is more appropriate for your, your, your statements, and then it comes out and spits out a number, and it says whether this is, do you think this is good enough? If it's not good enough, go back to the beginning and just iterate. So if I'm faced with a situation where I have to write code that is going to expose private data, I can run through this app if I choose to. The second one is EthicsNet. This is similar to um, ImageNet, which was created to have you know, just millions of data, uh, millions of images for you to do uh, machine learning on. It was the same idea. They have taken it and turned it into a database of ethical issues and the answers around it. So this is something which I think is useful, so at least you get to pose a question and see what answers come back, if you're not sure whether I should do this. And the last one is ACM has something called Ask an Ethicist, which is an interesting thing, but it's, I don't see much life in it right now. I only see like about six or seven questions that have been answered. So this is probably an area that we could probably contribute. I don't know how, but I think a combination of some of, the, uh, some of these will be a good way to start off. So this is the Markula Center uh, of Applied Ethics. This is their app. I just did a screenshot of it. You can run it on a phone, you can run it on your laptop, it doesn't really matter. I hate to have apps on the phone, so I prefer to use a laptop to do this. Uh, the Ethics Net. Um, and the last one is the ACM's uh, Ask an Ethicist. Unfortunately, like I said, they don't have much here, which is ideal for an opportunity to collaborate with them. So if we could consider at a chaos level to invite these three groups of people to see how we can collaborate with them to build something useful, that we can actually do something uh, as a group for the community that we represent. So there are numerous ethical tools. There are others who have done it. We are not unique. There are many others who have done similar kind of stuff. There is stuff for the healthcare, for leadership, and you name it. It's pretty much every entity that has got a code of ethics they generally support some kind of a tool for you to try and figure out what you're doing is ethical in the field that you are in. So trying to wrap up, um, I don't know if anybody can remember or know where this place is in terms of this particular image. It's the uh, Ponte Morandi, which is a bridge in Genoa in Italy. And last year, just shy of a, uh, just, just past a year ago, a part of the bridge collapsed. If you can see the difference between the two. All right? And that caused 43 people to die. This is an engineering failure. Engineers are under a lot of constraints. You don't sign off on something like a bridge and expect to get away with it when the bridge collapses. We sadly do not have any of those responsibilities. We have our warranty statements in our software that says it's not warranted for any good purpose. Use it at your own risk. How is it that we have been getting away with software with no warranty all these years? 
I just don't understand. Something is fundamentally broken here. And we have been living a lie in, for, for a very long time. Talking about information that is being uh, uh, extracted from a privacy point of view. This is one solution to keeping away from the cameras. Just go above the camera, right? This crow is above the camera. The camera doesn't know the crow is there. And in a way, it is kind of timely when if you look at this particular image, this is out of Hong Kong, end of last month. What the protesters in Hong Kong did, and this is actually quite clever on their part, is to use laser beams and, which is not mentioned in this particular thing, or doesn't, it's not showing up here, is they have hats that have got uh, infrared uh, LEDs in the front of it, or actually all around it. Essentially what happens is when you have infrared, uh, as it turned on, your cameras do not pick it up. Or let me rephrase it. All it sees is infrared, and the whole thing is washed out on the LCD cameras. So essentially, you put in front of you, you don't see the face anymore. Similar with the uh, laser beams. You point the laser beam at the camera, the camera goes blind. So that's what the Hong Kong protesters have been doing to get, get against the cameras that were observing them to figure out who is protesting. So they have done something in that regard to solve a problem. But hey, I'm sure there's somebody trying to figure out how do I get around this problem. So my parting thought is, if you have to make an ethical decision, even if it's going to be severely detrimental to you, whether it's physical, financial, emotional, or career limiting, I hope you will lean towards the ethical decision. It's not easy, but I think it's very important that you do so. And I'll give you one example that I faced myself when I was in graduate school uh, in the uh, 1980s. I was part of, I was on, on, connected to ARPANET. And we, I, was, I was in my lab and I saw a note that said, oh, you can connect to ftp.funet, f-u-n-e-t.fi. So here I was sitting in front of my tectronics machine and I just typed in ftp.funet.fi. And then you connected. And then I logged in anonymous. Connected. And for a moment I sat there, it's like, hey, I'm in here in, 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 in Corvallis. In Oregon, and I'm connected to a machine .fi. Where is this? Oh, this is in Finland. And who is paying for this? I felt so guilty at that point, I disconnected. Disconnected and I said, wow, I, I did something wrong here. I was not aware of what I was trying to do. So I said, you know what, I better send an email to the administrator. I sent him a note, I said, Otto, I did this. Uh, I think I may have to pay for that, so tell me how much it's gonna cost. He replied saying, oh, don't worry about it, Harish. This is uh, paid by the Department of Defense, so go ahead and have fun. So to me, I, that was not the answer I was expecting. <laughs> I thought he was going to say, sorry, buddy, you have violated some ethical code that you just used your, the services of the university to do something. And I really felt bad. But I felt good at the end, looking back after 30 years, and say, I think that was the right thing I did. So with that, thank you very much. I think as a collective, we need to find a way to get as many developers to understand that, the fact, the fact that we need to do something, and I think more and more people recognize that, uh, and we need to show tools that allow that to be done trivially. Like, I mean, the example that I gave the Markala Center, I mean, it, it, that's a, that, when I saw that tool, I said, wow, that's an easy enough tool for someone to do something with. Instead of saying, oh, follow this step, step two, step three, step four, and so on. I think that's a good uh, starting point. So, thank you. Thank you. You need the mic. Let's go. Yes.